In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you. Let us pray. O God, who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. For he fashioned all things that they might have being, and the creatures of the world are wholesome. And there is not a destructive drug among them, nor any domain of the netherworld on earth. For justice is undying, for God formed man to be imperishable. The, the image of his own nature he made him, but by the envy of the devil, death entered the world, and they who belong to him company, company experience it. The word, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will praise you, Lord, for you.
Lectura de la segunda carta del apóstol San Pablo a los Corintios. Hermanos, ya que ustedes se distinguen en todo, en fe, en palabra, en sabiduría, en diligencia para todo y en amor hacia nosotros, distinganse también ahora por su generosidad. Bien saben lo generoso que ha sido nuestro Señor Jesucristo, que siendo rico se hizo pobre por ustedes, para que ustedes se hicieran ricos con su pobreza. No se trata de que los demás vivan tranquilos mientras ustedes están sufriendo. Se trata más bien de aplicar durante nuestra vida una medida justa. Porque entonces la abundancia de ustedes remediará las carencias de ellos y ellos por su parte los socorrerán a ustedes en sus necesidades. En esa forma habrá un justo medio, como dice la Escritura. Al que recogía mucho, nada le sobraba. Al que recogía poco, nada le faltaba. Palabra de Dios. Te alabamos, Señor. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, o Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials, named Jairus, came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come. Lay your hands on her, that she may get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid, just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kuom, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a child of 12, arose immediately and walked around. At that, they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We prayed as we began Mass in the opening prayer. Grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to be standing in the bright light of truth. 
If you paid attention to the news at all, you'll know that there's currently a kerfuffle going on between the Catholic bishops and Catholic politicians who are pro-choice. Um, as the media usually does, they muddy the waters and they don't get the Catholic Church right. Uh, so there's been the suggestion that some of the Catholic bishops want the conference to excommunicate pro-choice Catholic politicians. Here's why that's not going to happen. The national conferences of bishops do not have that power. That is not their purpose. They don't excommunicate anybody. The local bishop has the canonical authority to excommunicate. And immediately following, the one who has the declaration of excommunication can get themselves a canon lawyer and appeal it all the way to Rome. That's the way that it works. So that was never on the table with this um, meeting that the Conference of Bishops are going to have. They wanted to talk about Eucharistic coherence. And what this term means is, if we receive Eucharist up here, well, we have to live Eucharistic lives out there. This can't just be a thing that we do on Sunday where we love Jesus for an hour and proclaim ourselves to be Catholic for an hour and then go away to lives where we live contrary to the Gospels or contrary to the teachings of the church. That's always been a part of our Catholic faith. Canon 915 of the Catholic Church says this, those upon whom the penalty of excommunication or interdict has been imposed or declared, and others who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. That is the law of the church and has been. It's not something that I'm at liberty to dispense with. I don't get to decide when to put this into play and when not to. The obedience of the promises that I made requires that I obey this law. And it doesn't say sometimes can be admitted, sometimes probably shouldn't, make your best judgment. It says people who fall into these categories are not to be admitted to Holy Communion. There's no confusion over this issue. Others who obstinately persist in manifest grave sin. What does that mean? Um, when I was younger and first saw The Godfather, it's a great movie, I was always scandalized by that one scene where Michael takes his child to be baptized in the Catholic Church, and you have a, a mafia member standing as godparent to the baby being baptized. And you just look at that and say, it's all fake. It doesn't mean anything. These people don't believe. They're just going through the motions of culture. It's a scandal to see that sort of thing. If there were in our local area um, a leader of a neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, um, racist group who proudly proclaimed it in public that this is what he believed and wanted to come forward and receive communion, I hope everyone would agree with me I shouldn't give that person communion. It would be scandalous to see that happen. Um, I shouldn't give communion to Satanists. I shouldn't give communion to those who identify themselves as atheists, who don't believe that God exists. I shouldn't give communion to those uh, who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I should not give communion to anyone who denies that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. That 
flows kind of rather naturally from what the act of communion is. And there's at least two levels of it. The first is union with Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But along with that act is a proclamation in the very act of receiving communion that we are in union with the whole church. And so if we don't believe what the church teaches, how can we make an act which proclaims that we do? There's a lack of integrity when we decide for ourselves what we will believe of the church's teachings or of the sacred scriptures and nevertheless present ourselves in an act which declares to everyone else that we believe. It's a scandal that we have Catholic politicians who are very, very open about disagreeing with the teachings of the church on morality, especially around issues of marriage, abortion, sexuality, those kinds of things. And nevertheless, they claim to be devout Catholics. It's a disgrace. St. Paul wrote concerning it in his first letter to the Corinthians. For as often as you shall eat this bread and drink the chalice, you shall show the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink the chalice of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the chalice. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment unto himself, not discerning the body of the Lord. Therefore are there many infirm and weak among you, and many have died. Did you catch that? St. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said to the church in Corinth, the reason why many of you are sick and many have died is because you have received communion unworthily. That's how serious this act is. And so sometimes people uh, they want a church that stands for nothing. All are welcome. Come as you are. And when the church insists upon discipline, or a priest insists upon obedience, then we say, well, that mean old church, that strict, mean priest, it is not mercy to allow those to receive communion whom we know not to be worthy. It is not love to not care what people believe or how they live their lives. Every year when we celebrate the Feast of Corpus Christi, um, we have the sequence which comes between the second reading and the Alleluia. It's called the Laudus Zion. And so it is part of the church's liturgical tradition and therefore part of what she teaches concerning the Eucharist. And it says this, bad and good, the feast are sharing of what diverse dooms preparing, endless death or endless life. Life to these, the good, to those, damnation, the bad. See how like participation is with unlike issues rife. To receive communion unworthily is to eat and drink unto your condemnation. And therefore, it's never a gentle, never a kind thing for a priest or a bishop to look the other way and let you simply remain in a state of life that is contrary to the gospel and teachings of the church. 
Now, some people will claim, don't weaponize the Eucharist. Don't politicize the Eucharist or the Catholic faith. Well, is it me who is doing this? Or is it not rather the politicians who claim in one and the same breath to be devout Catholics, who nevertheless go on to deny core doctrines of the church? They are the ones politicizing the Eucharist. They are the ones politicizing the Catholic faith. This shouldn't be something that we have any confusion about. And yet, nevertheless, we do. One of those politicians, upon hearing that the Conference of Catholic Bishops were going to get together and talk about this, immediately tweeted out a list of four or five things that he knew to be contrary to the Catholic faith, that he professed his support for anyways, and then ended it with, I dare you to deny me communion. Whatever other uh, kind of uh, dialogue needs to take place, the one guy I'm pretty sure shouldn't be receiving communion is the guy that says, I dare you to deny it to me. What hubris. We got into this place because Catholic priests and Catholic bishops, and perhaps sometimes Catholic deacons, but probably mostly priests and bishops, they're afraid. They don't have the courage to tell you the truth. And because they lack the courage to speak plainly and lovingly the truth, people go for years and years and years living however they want and still thinking of themselves as Catholics in good standing. If you think that priests like to tell someone that they can't come to confession, or if they, they like to tell someone that you shouldn't come to communion, you don't know what a priest is. You don't know what we gave our lives for. There's nothing pleasant about that conversation. I want you to have access to the sacraments. But I became a priest to save souls. And I won't pretend that anyone is in a place and let them continue on to the path of eternal damnation simply because I'm afraid to have that conversation. Every parent knows what those conversations looks like. And that's real love. Dietrich von Hoffer, who was a German Lutheran pastor during the time of, of the Nazis, and he opposed the Nazis. He was an anti-Nazi dissident. Christians in Germany, somewhere along the way, started listening more to the society around them and accepted more from the national stuff going on rather than standing firm in the faith of their Christian profession. But a few withstood their nonsense. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged for being faithful to Jesus at the age of 39. And he wrote what I'm going to read to you in his book called The Cost of Discipleship. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap jacks wares. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cutthroat prices. Grace is represented as the church's inexhaustible treasury from which she showers blessings with generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price, grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance. And because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Since the cost was infinite, the possibilities of using and spending it are infinite. What would grace be if it were not cheap? Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion 
without confession, by that he means confession of the faith, like in our creed, and absolution without personal confession, by that he means the confession of sins. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. If many, many years ago, a priest or a bishop had had the courage to pull aside these politicians and confront them with the truth that sets them free, free. Maybe they wouldn't be in the position that they are now in. They began with, I'm personally against abortion, but I don't think that I should impose my morality upon anyone else. Right? It's a Catholic thing, is what they're trying to say. As if you can separate your Catholic beliefs into a private life and have a completely different public life. You cannot. Either Jesus is the center of our hearts, from whom we draw the source of all that we do, or we aren't following Jesus. From that slogan of I'm personally against it, we've come to the place now where we have politicians who claim to be Catholic, who no longer say simply I'm personally against it, they uphold it as a right, as if it's a good that they are doing. Uh, they think that it flows from their Catholic faith, that they're doing something just. This is what the darkness of error does to us. Little by little, we grow more and more blind to the truth. All the other slogans, our objection to abortion is not primarily a religious one. It is a human one. And the science is on our side, as they would say. We know by science that it is a unique life with its own DNA structure. So we know that it is a human life. And so the the contrary slogan, my body, my choice, is quite apart from the point, it's not your body, it's the baby's body. 
and there could be nothing more contrary to Eucharistic coherence than the slogan, my body, my choice, or her body, her choice. It's the diabolical inverse, in fact, of what we celebrate in the Eucharist. This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. This isn't about the church being political. Certainly not about me being political. I really care very little about politics. I'm not a very political kind of guy. Um, it's not about me being a Republican because I'm not one, right? Uh, so that's not where this is coming from. It comes from the very gift that we receive at the altar. What does it mean to be in union with Jesus and a member of the mystical body of Christ? Do I get to make it up as I go? For at least the past 50 years, our problem is we've been making it up as we go. Priests have looked the other way while Catholic couples have contracepted. Priests have looked the other way while you've gotten divorced and remarried outside of the church. They said nothing about sins. It's why we're in a place where uh, we can no longer say that identifying one as a Catholic means that you believe certain things. It appears to be all up for grams. And it's a dangerous place for us Catholics to be. This act that we do has to mean something. It has to convert us. So yes, all are welcome. All are welcome to embrace the Catholic faith whole and entire. All are welcome to repent of their sins and follow Christ by the help of his grace. Come as you are, but don't stay that way. Let yourself be transformed by the power of the divine mysteries, by the truth of holy scriptures, and the teaching of the church. This is our responsibility as Catholics, to be faithful and obedient to these things. So I would say to you, if there is anyone here who thinks that women have a right to an abortion, who want to support those things, or who support Planned Parenthood, do not receive Holy Communion. You place yourself in danger of eternal condemnation when you do. If any of the other things, and there's a whole list of hot button, hot button stuff that Catholics think they're free to disagree with the church about, if you disagree with the teachings of the church, her catechism, the sacred scriptures, do not present yourself for Holy Communion. The greatest act of love I can show you is to tell you it's dangerous. Pray through it. Be converted in faith. Repent and confess. And then come to receive the gift that you might have the fullness of blessings that flow from it. That's my promise to you as a priest. I will always give you what the church officially teaches to shine the light of truth on our lives, my life included, that we're always in the process of conversion and we don't think of the grace that we receive from the Eucharist as something cheap that cost us nothing. It cost us everything, sometimes jobs, power, prestige, friends, sometimes even family, but it's worth the price. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. 
I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now make our prayer for our community and for the world. For the Holy Church of God, let us pray to the Lord. For all who do not yet believe, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who hold public office, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For fallen away and non-practicing Catholics, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the repose of the souls of the faithful departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Incline your merciful ear to our prayers, we ask, O Lord, and listen in kindness to the supplications of those who call upon you. Through Christ our Lord. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all his holy church. O God, who graciously accomplished the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him you have been pleased to renew all things, giving us all a share in his fullness. For though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself and by the blood of his cross brought peace to all creation. Therefore he has been exalted above all things, and to all who obey him has become the source of eternal salvation. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Thomas, our Bishop, and his assistant bishop, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, and her blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you.
in a similar way when supper was ended. He took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest, Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. Through Christ our Lord, amen. To us also, your servants, who, those sinners, hope in your abundant mercies. Graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you into their company not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by the divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. 
Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. May this divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord, we pray, so that bound to you in lasting charity, we may bear fruit that lasts forever. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Deacon just has a few short things to say. Remain standing. Good morning. <clears throat> For uh, this week and the next two weeks, we're going to be having a uh, pre registration for this year's religious education classes for children and for adults. Um, I wanted to make sure that we uh, were prepared a little bit better this year by having an idea of what the numbers will be. So if you could stop in in the narthex, um, that's that between those doors right there. Uh, there's a table. I'll be there as soon as I get this hot thing off and uh, and we can sign you up. It'll only take about two minutes. There's no cost for religious education at our parish. And um, yeah, and if you know any child who's not here or any parents who aren't or even grandparents, because sometimes they're the drivers in bringing their children to religious education, please help me spread the word. We're, uh, we're doing a little pre-registration this year, trying something different. Thank you. All right, I'll ask you, um, to keep in your prayers in a very intentional way our Catholic politicians, that they be witnesses to their Catholic faith, and also to pray especially for priests and bishops, that they have the courage to speak the truth to their own flock. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before the Mass is ended. Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you.